Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, apologies for not being there with you today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've had to go somewhere else. I've been asked to give some insights into the uh, investigation I conducted on the 2007 Burnley incident. And I don't propose to take too much of your time doing that. Uh, it's bad enough to, uh, to listen to me in the flesh, uh, let alone having to watch me on a video screen. I think the first and most important thing uh, to mention is that in a coronial investigation, the role that an investigator takes is one of being impartial and also based on the facts of the particular situation. So in this case, in the Burnley case, because there'd been several fatalities and because there was such an outcry publicly uh, for the deaths and uh, particularly for the, and also for the disruption in Melbourne, there was considerable pressure put upon me both directly and indirectly to attribute blame uh, for, for the fatalities. And of course, an operator is the uh, obvious person to blame. The reason I bring that to your attention is, for those of you who've worked with me before, uh, it's the operator who perhaps is most exposed to an allegation of either negligence or criminal misconduct, and yet it's the operator who's least able to protect themselves and whom is also most vulnerable uh, to an attack. So in this case, in order to satisfy myself uh, as to the circumstances of the deaths, the circumstances of the event, I had particular regard to the facts as revealed forensically uh, through the various systems, computers, CCTV and what have you within uh, the computers uh, at CityLink. It, it may come as a surprise to you to know that that forensic exercise revealed aspects of the event that even the operators weren't aware of. And I think what's interesting for all of us is to recognise that with these complex machines such as our, our tunnels, particularly the more modern ones, almost every aspect of every second of every device, of every image, of every action, in fact of everything that takes place in that machine during an incident such as this is recorded. And so with the benefit of hindsight, uh, the, the conduct of a, an operator or the um, aspects of the design and the um, sufficiency of the design can easily be uh, dissected and torn apart, which is in fact what I did. And what I found in the Burnley incident, and what was important to, to discuss, but I was uh, not able to discuss for several years due to the uh, restrictions, uh, restrictions on the publication of the results, was that the machine itself, the supervisory computer systems, the uh, operational environment, whatever you want to call it, actually didn't cope uh, as well as one might imagine a machine such as this would cope. And what I mean by that is you would imagine that the machine would be able to cope with multiple events. Uh, you would imagine perhaps that the machine would be able to cope with changes in the command sequences during an event. But what in fact I found when looking very carefully at the code was very similar to what had happened in the Chernobyl incident, uh, the uh, Chernobyl nuclear reactor meltdown, where the, the code itself was so complex and the computer power behind the system was so comparatively limited that the system slowed right down and was trying to um, progress with a series of commands which predated the actual um, escalating incident itself. Why am I sharing that with you? Well, some, some would argue that was a deficiency in the machine. Um, others would say that's a symptom of a, a complex machine and that's what's to be expected. But what I had to do was to forensically examine what actually occurred and then compare that with the circumstances around the fatalities themselves. And through that detailed analysis, not only did I form a view that it, it wasn't, in fact, this um, 
this behaviour of the machine that was responsible for the deaths. Um, but more than that, it was the expertise of the human operators recognising that there was an issue with the machine. And for some of you there, when I use the term issue, you'll probably take, you'll take issue with me and say you can't say it's an issue, that's just a feature of the machine. But, but the operators themselves, and I think Scott's already spoken to you, Scott and his team actually recognised that it was necessary to um, manually intervene, and they did manually intervene. And that manual intervention uh, also helped with the response, particularly in relation to the deluge systems. I think that's awesome. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to talk about that again because of the, the suppression orders um, that have been placed upon my report. Now, having, having said all of that, uh, the, the fact is, and the fact is clearly reflected in the report that I've prepared, that the deluge systems played a critical role uh, in making sure that the Burnley incident was a comparatively small incident in terms of the fire and didn't end up being like the Mont Blanc, Goddard, multi-fatality, um, accelerating away sorts of incidents that we'd seen earlier in Europe. And for the world which has been you know, trying to balance up whether or not to invest in fire suppression systems or not fire suppression systems and, and the debate that's raged and indeed is still raging about whether to use mist systems or fog systems or deluge systems and all the, all the ins and outs of that, here is a well documented example of how fire suppression systems when activated quickly, accurately, um, actually do make a difference and really did, I think in this case, uh, contribute to uh, an event which didn't get away, didn't cause more deaths. The deaths were directly related to the initial impacts. So from, from my perspective as, a, as an investigator, um, as a colleague of yours, um, as a, a someone with a keen interest in how tunnels perform and the safety of tunnels, I, I recommend grabbing a copy of the report. Um, it's available online. Um, easy enough to find, just Google Burnley Report or if you're really stuck um, you can go to my uh, website um, www.arnoldix.com pretty hard to remember, it's just my name uh, and I've hosted a copy of that there and I've also hosted a copy of the written transcripts of the court proceedings uh, and some articles as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, oh, I think that's enough from me uh, it's bad enough having to listen to me when I'm there in person, but uh, having to look to, uh, look to a recorded head, I think, is uh, uh, even more troubling. And I wish you well in your conference. Uh, thank you very much from, um, from far away. Thank you.